and we will move on to our next speaker, uh, Dr. Cormack. Okay, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Great, okay, let me share my screen. All right, is that showing up all right, Matt? Yes, it is. All right, good morning, everyone. I'm Fanula Cormack, and um, I work at the Kidney Stone Center at UWMC Northwest. Today, I'm going to talk with you about calcium phosphate and um, specifically brushite, brushite stone disease. Um, and I have no disclosures. So we'll start with a case. Let me get my pointer up and running. Um, so I was inspired to talk about phosphate stones and in particular brushite um, kidney stones by a patient um, whom I recently saw. Um, this was a 55-year-old woman with recurrent um, brushite stones. Um, she had a 30-plus history of kidney stones and um, was diagnosed in her 20s. She says, you know, her stone disease was pretty uneventful. So for, you know, a good number of years, she'd pass a stone every once in a while. Um, the composition was calcium oxalate. She never had a surgical intervention. She said, you know, her stone disease was not particularly disruptive. And then three years ago, um, she developed some flank pain, had imaging, and was found to have bilateral large kidney stones, um, staghorn calculi, and underwent surgery, surgical intervention for these stones, and was found to have predominantly brushite stones. So the stone composition was 80% brushite, 10% apatite, um, also known as hydroxyapatite, which is calcium phosphate, and 10% um, calcium oxalate dihydrate. So since then, she's had recurrent brushite stones um, necessitating multiple surgeries over the last few years. So when she came to see me, she had um, some pretty obvious questions. Um, this was a woman who had been previously very active. She coached high school soccer. Um, she traveled a lot. And in the few years that she was struggling with brushite stone disease, um, she was fearful of travel, unable to work, um, both because of um, recovering from surgeries and focusing on her fluid intake and, and just really, really compromised by her stone disease. So the questions she had coming in to see me were, what changed? You know, why is it that you know, stone disease was not a big deal for me all my life and the last few years, that's not the case. Why are my kidneys doing this? And is there anything we can do to prevent stones? So all very appropriate questions and certainly a challenge for me to, um, to try to help her and answer those questions. This was her 24-hour urine collection. And uh, as you know, we rely very heavily on these in terms of estimating um, patients' risk factors and also for um, monitoring their um, response to therapy. So, her initial 24-hour urine collection shows a urine volume of just under two liters, which we would consider low for a stone former. Uh, we you know, tell our patients to drink at least three liters of water a day, and we want to see a urine volume you know, at least of 2.5 liters. She had high urine calcium. This is 282 milligrams over a 24-hour period. We've talked before that high urine calcium or hypercalcemia. I always put in quotations, it's not a dichotomous value, it's really a continuous variable for stone formers. So, um, you know, technically over 200 is high, but certainly if someone is still forming stones with um, calciums 200 or greater, or maybe even high 100s, we want to think about managing that. Um, we weren't I'm not particularly interested in her oxalate because she's predominantly a calcium um, phosphate stone former. Her citrate, interestingly, was normal, um, and we'll show in later slides that it's more common for calcium phosphate stone formers to have low urinary citrate. 
And then importantly, the su her supersaturation of calcium phosphate was what we consider high at 2.54. Um, we'll be spending more time talking about that. And her urine pH was also high at 6.79. So for workup, um, she had normal kidney function. Um, sh she had been evaluated for systemic causes of hypercalciuria, like primary hyperparathyroidism. Um, those results were in normal range, um, no history of hypercalcemia. Um, so essentially looking for any systemic causes of her calcium phosphate stone disease, and, and the, the workup was unrevealing. And um, to that point, this discussion today um, is um, will focus on idiopathic um, phosphate stone formers. So for my outline, I thought it would make sense to address our patients' questions, which were what changed. Um, to, to get at that, we'll look at the epidemiology and clinical features of idiopathic calcium phosphate stone disease, um, not today's. And to answer her question, why are my kidneys doing this? We'll talk about calcium phosphate histopathology and biomineralization. And finally, is there anything we can do to prevent these stones? Um, a reasonable question. Um, so we'll look at prevention stat um, strategies for idiopathic phosphate stone formers. There, um, <laughs> there's a lot of alphabet soup when it comes to stone formers and stone literature. And so you'll see a lot of abbreviations here. So IPSF um, is used for idiopathic phosphate stone formers. So epidemiology and clinical features of calcium phosphate stone disease. Important to talk first about um, nomenclature and to acquaint everyone with um, stone composition nomenclature. So if a calcium phosphate stone former, this is ICSF for idiopathic uh, calcium stone former, has a mineral composition of over 50% calcium oxalate, they're classified as calcium oxalate stone formers. And if they have greater than 50% calcium phosphate um, composition, then they're classified as idiopathic phosphate um, stone formers. Um, but interestingly, um, for these crystals um, in this uh, green um, table, these stones are classified according to their constituents. So that means that if a stone if you send a stone for an analysis and it has any percent of brushite, um, we consider it a brushite stone. And similarly with uric acid, um, struvite, and cysteine. This is data from Mayo Clinics. The, this is um, data published by Liskey um, based on stone analyses from 2010. Um, during that year, they analyzed over 40,000 stones. I, I think in 2019, it was 90,000 stones. Um, so you see here that calcium oxalate is the most common stone, and I think most of us know that. So in this cohort, and again, these were the first stones formed by these individuals, 67% um, were calcium oxalate. Um, and for apatite or calcium phosphate, 16% um, and brushite is very uncommon. So brushite 0.9%. This uh, figure um, really provides a lot of information. Um, so it's showing a percentage of stone type on the y-axis versus age on the x-axis. Um, and then we've, um, we see the um, percentages for men on top and women on bottom. Um, so this rectangular bar depicts calcium oxalate, and you know, as we expect to see, um, in both men and women, um, they predominantly form calcium oxalate stones. What's striking about these figures is um, considering appetite um, stone formation. So what you see here is that, number one, women um, form more appetite. So that's this um, 
I think we've, we're going to add some color here. So um, this blue line depicts appetite. And so women form more than men. But interestingly, women between ages 20 and 40 actually have a 50-50 ratio um, between um, calcium phosphate stone formation and calcium oxalate stone formation. Um, so certainly calcium phosphate stones are more common in, um, in women. And there is a caveat to that because as we'll see with later data, brushite stones are actually more common in men. Um, then around age 50, um, you know, both men and women drop off in terms of their calcium phosphate stone formation. And interestingly, you see this rise in um, uric acid um, stone formation after age 50. So something just to keep in mind. And again, calcium phosphate, or excuse me, calcium oxalate always predominates. So the question is, you know, and this is what's been observed is, um, you know, why is the prevalence of calcium phosphate increasing? And so what's been noted is over the last four decades, um, and excuse me, this is a, a typo, the number of people producing calcium um, phosphate stones has progressively increased over the last four decades. Um, there are many theories um, positing why this might be, perhaps it's more alkali therapy um, being given for calcium oxalate stones, so more urine alkalinization among stone formers. Um, there are some theories that um, shockwave therapy um, can lead to problems with urine acidification, so that's also been posited. Um, more medications like topiramate and nisamide have been used in recent decades, um, both of which call, cause a renal tubular acidosis and lead to higher urinary pH and low urine citrate, which are um, essentially um, the high, some of the highest risk factors for forming calcium phosphate stones. Um, and then there's, um, because of this rising incidence of kidney stones in women, that may also be playing a role. Um, one other thought is uh, there are, we see less struvite stones as um, more, as we have better um, treatments or earlier interventions for um, urinary tract infections. Um, so, you know, what are some of the numbers regarding the, this change in prevalence? So um, Mandel's group um, evaluated 33 stones in the VA population and found a 1% increase in hydroxyapatite stones um, and a 3% increase in brushite stones over a 15-year period. What's also been observed in this study and others is that calcium oxalate stone formers um, are converting to calcium phosphate um, stone formation, so that's also contributing to these numbers. Um, Crambeck, working with Fred Coe's group, um, looked at 82 brushite stone formers and found that almost 20% converted to brushite stone disease from another stone type. So what do we know about brushite? Um, so calcium phosphate exists in three different forms in the urinary tract, um, hydroxyapatite, brushite, and then um, carbonate apatite, which you'll also see in, in some of your um, stone composition analyses. What's important to know is brushite is the precursor. So brushite comes first. Um, it's the precursor phase to apatite, which is what we more commonly see in kidney stones. Brushite is a very, very unstable um, crystal structure. It exists one-to-one um, -one with calcium, whereas um, apatite um, basically has, um, doesn't have a one-to-one -one distribution between calcium and phosphate. So it's a lot more stable and that's what comprises our bones. Um, so very very stable structure. Um, it's, it's really not understood why brush eyes might persist in the urine um, and lead to stones. And so that is um, a source of a lot of debate and, um, and study, but, but um, to date, it's, it's unclear. Um, so, you know, compared to um, both calcium oxalate stones and hydroxyapatite stones, uh, brushite stones are it, having brushite stones is considered a much more severe disease. So, brushite stones are harder; they're more difficult to treat, um, more likely to require surgical intervention, and more of them. Um, they've been found to be resistant to shockwave therapy. And one one interesting thought is, you know, 
<clears throat> if patients have been treated with a lot of shockwave therapy to try to remove these stones, maybe that in turn has caused these acidification defects, but that's, you know, conjecture. Um, most of these stones are large bilateral. They recur um, and um, often necessitate, you know, multiple surgeries and treatment with um, percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Um, what's interesting, too, is that um, despite that procedure, which is very, you know, which is invasive and where our urology colleagues, you know, actually go in and um, are removing a bulk of stone. Despite that, it's been found that these patients are less likely to be stone-free after that procedure um, and often will need a, a second procedure. So an important point to make about calcium phosphate as we move forward is just thinking about um, the, you know, the chemistry of phosphate in the urine. And so as many of you know, um, phosphate exists as an acid-base buffer pair um, in solution and the, the pK for um, for divalent phosphate is, um, is 6.8. So what that means is that um, in a urine pH of 6.8, um, there's going to be more divalent um, phosphate available to bind calcium. Um, so important that we, we appreciate that when we think about um, urine alkalinization. Um, so again, brushite is the initial phase, um, but more commonly um, people will um, go on to develop um, hydroxyapatite um, crystals. So what are some of the metabolic risk factors for brushite stone disease? Um, so this figure shows urinary findings from the 82 brushite stone formers that were evaluated by Fred Coe's group. Um, the um, percentage is on the y-axis and then the different urinary risk factors are on the um, on the x-axis. And these findings are very similar to what have been reported in um, other studies looking at um, brushite stone formers. And so um, we see that high urine calcium um, is present in about 80% of brushite stone formers. And similarly, in other studies, um, they other, other investigators have reported 60 to 80%. Um, high urine pH, again, very common, so um, reported 50 to 60 percent of the time in brushite stone formers, low urine volume, and then importantly, um, low urinary citrate, um, and that's reported about 30 to, to 50 percent of the time, similar um, in this study. So, in talking about metabolic risk factors, um, I think it, it's um, very important to uh, try to understand the biomineralization and histopathology in stone disease. Um, very complicated topic. We'll, we'll start with a very early paper. This is um, from Charlie Pack in 1971. Um, and and so Dr. Pack was convinced that brushite really played um, an important regulatory role in stone formation um, and reasons that we should, you know, pay attention to the supersaturation of brushite. And what he showed in this study um, is basically, um, as I've said um, previously, is that brushite is first. So that's that's really the, um, the first crystal to form. Um, and, you know, what he proposed is that brushite um, basically then is um, metabolized to hydroxyapatite, um, which then inform, um, forms plaques, which then in turn forms plaques, and then calcium oxide grows on these. So if we are to intercept this process, it would be trying to sort out how to prevent um, brushite from precipitating in the first place. Um, so we'll just um, look at these results, which is essentially looking at, um, th this is a study where um, he actually used brushite seeds and grew brushite in urine solution and, and found that, you know, at higher pHs, um, we see brushite, but then after that, hydroxyapatite. So in talking about, um, you know, stone production, uh, we'd be remiss not to mention um, Dr. Randall. So Dr. Randall, Alexander Randall, was a urologist at University of Pennsylvania. And this is his paper written in 1937, which describes Randall's plaques, which um, most of us are familiar with. Um, and so um, he, using autopsy samples, or uh, 
um, kidneys from autopsy, he described the um, renal papilla and described calcium phosphate plaque on the papilla and proposed that um, this was essentially the nidus for stone formation. Um, so since then, there's certainly been a little more um, sophistication with respect to studying biomineralization. And Stoller's group has done a lot of sophisticated work to tease out the pathology of um, papillary mineralization. Um, so these are some very beautiful cartoons. Um, this one depicting a renal papilla and focusing on this um, medullopapillary complex. And so, you know, the point, the point in, in their studies is that, um, you know, mineralization is happening way before you develop your, your plaque um, here at the bottom. Um, and if you look at, you know, your, um, your medullary papillary complex, um, there's a lot going on here, as we all know. So you have your, your, your blood vessels, um, your microvasculature, and then your tubules. And, and, you know, the main focus are these large collecting tubules, which descend to the bottom. Um, and typically, you'll have about 10 in each papilla forming your ducts of Bellini. Um, so they posit that there's kind of a four-step process to this mineralization, that there is a proximal um, intratubular mineralization, um, which kind of gets things going. Um, and then, then there's, um, you know, interstitial um, renal papilla, or sorry, renal Randall's plaque developing towards the papilla um, and then kind of emerging um, through the papillary tissue. Um, so again, it's, it's sort of a, um, obviously more dynamic and probably, um, a, you know, a, a, a long process that's happening maybe even decades before people have their first stone. Um, this is a beautiful picture um, taken with um, very sophisticated um, CTs and showing a very, this is a, actually a micro CT, um, showing this beautiful formation and essentially this, this is the papilla, um, the papilla with the crystallization, as we said, coming from proximal to distal, forming Randall's plaque. Um, and then what their group has observed is both interstitial mineralization, which is important, um, but also this um, idea of a plug um, on which the, the stones then form. So this is work from um, Fred Coe's group and basically just showing different tissue samples of patients. So this is, um, the study in particular was looking at nephrocalcinosis um, and trying to differentiate um, the presence of nephrocalcinosis in idiopathic stone formers, um, differentiating between calcium phosphate and um, calcium oxalate stone formers. Um, and so, the, the upshot of, of these images is that um, in looking at renal papilla from hydroxyapatite stone formers versus um, brushite stone formers and comparing to um, calcium oxalate stone formers, they're seeing a lot more disease. Um, so in particularly um, in the tissue samples, they're seeing mineralization in the collecting ducts and that's not observed in um, calcium oxalate stone formers. Um, and a lot of intratubular um, crystal deposition um, and what they're calling plugs, which again is not observed in idiopathic calcium stone formers. Um, this were, these were some beautiful pictures of the actual stones. So um, here's apatite and brush ice. And again, just to show this plug, um, which can have other composition, like in this brush ice stone, some calcium oxalate, some apatite, um, and then the, the stone on the left side. So putting this all together, um, this is a really nice table showing um, the different clinical features of these um, calcium phenotypes. And, and really to make the point that we believe that these are three distinct diseases. Um, so in the first column, we have the idiopathic calcium stone formers next to the brushite stone formers and the apatite stone formers. Um, and really the take home from this are that we see more severe disease with brushite stone formers. Um, 
there is um, more papillary injury. Um, and again, to just bring home this interesting point, which is that brushite stones are more common in men um, compared to women, even though women um, are more likely to form calcium phosphate stones. Um, but again, in contrast to the idiopathic calcium stone formers, um, calcium phosphate stone formers, in particular, brush, particular brushite stone formers, have larger papillary plugs. They have um, papillary scarring and inflammation, so much more severe um, histological disease. Um, and I, I didn't show slides for this, but they also biopsied glomeruli and, did, and um, interstitium and showed more interstitial fibrosis and even glomerular sclerosis in brushite stone formers. There have been studies looking at um, um, an association with chronic kidney disease, you know, are these patients more likely to develop chronic kidney disease? Um, that really has not been borne out, um, but um, we can certainly see that untreated disease um, increases risk for, for more um, inflammation and fibrosis. So with all of that said, um, what can we do to help these patients? Um, so urine saturation is very important. And I think if we, if we were to reconsider this patient's um, urine chemistry and, and essentially give her uh, numbers that look more consistent with most of the calcium phosphate stone formers we see, um, we'd also give her low citrate. As you recall, she actually had normal citrate levels. So this is typically what we'll see with our calcium phosphate stone formers, low urine volume, high urine calcium, low urine citrate. And then importantly, this um, high supersaturation of calcium phosphate. And so um, when we think about a saturated sample, um, a supersaturation of one um, essentially means that all of our ions are in solution. And so over one is a supersaturated sample. So let's talk about that a bit when it comes to calcium phosphate stones. I think the question that um, I get asked the most is, can I give citrate? Um, and so, you know, I think we have to consider that in our patients with low urinary citrate, but, um, you know, under what conditions um, is citrate helpful versus harmful? Um, so citrate is, you know, very helpful in terms of, um, sorry, next slide, um, in terms of being a stone inhibitor. Um, there's probably a lot of different steps um, whereby citrate um, helps to prevent stones. So it sequesters um, both calcium and phosphate, um, but it's also been shown to um, stabilize the crystal matrix. So downstream of just binding up calcium, which is kind of what we always tell patients it does, um, it also, you know, has an effect on surface crystals and, and acts as an inhibitor there. Um, so supersaturation is important, and it's important because it's really the driving force behind crystallization. And um, so if someone's producing new stones, I think the question is, you know, what supersaturation should we, should we be aiming for? If someone's producing new stones, then their urine supersaturation is too high. Um, so we want to lower the risk of crystallization. We want to lower their supersaturation. Um, and stone crystal composition composition tends to follow supersaturation. Excuse me, let me, um, so yeah, so I think that this is just summarized here. Um, I just wanted to make the point that, you know, the risk of stone formation does continually increase with supersaturation that's been shown in studies. Um, and, and really we don't consider, or we don't have really a normal range for supersaturation. I will say also that, you know, this was a study in calcium oxalate stone formers, but lowering supersaturation um, in one study by 50% did, um, was associated with an 80% drop in recurrence rate. Um, so there aren't many studies in calcium phosphate stone formers. Um, these are some of them. And, you know, and I think the issue with supersaturation is um, depending on how it's measured using whatever um, computer program, we might get different results. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. Um, I'll just mention this study, which um, 
treated patients with potassium citrate for seven days um, and did not see a change in supersaturation. So, um, you know, I, I think that I'm not sure how helpful that is, you know, for our patients. Um, but I do think that um, in understanding stone disease and management, and I realize we're, we're almost out of time, um, I just want to just talk very quickly about supersaturation and highlight this gentleman. Um, this is, um, he was known by his friends as Bird Finlayson, and he was a urologist, um, a amazing researcher. He also had a PhD in biophysics, um, and he um, came up with Equal 2. Equal 2 is basically the program that we still use to calculate supersaturation. There are others. And basically, when we talk about supersaturation, um, what, what this computer program is doing is it's an iterative mathematical, mathematical model looking at um, the ions in solution and telling us um, basically how much um, calcium ion is present on its own um, with the potential to crystallize. So it takes into account everything that calcium, for instance, will bind with, um, and then essentially leaves us with, with a number that tells us what is um, the force for crystallization. So that's how you can use that number. Um, so in conclusion, um, and th these were some of the calculations that he did, and we won't, we won't belabor those. Um, you know, how do we, how do we approach brushite stone formation and particularly calcium phosphate disease in, in general? Um, so I think very important to monitor urine saturation and um, we try to target a supersaturation of calcium phosphate less than one. I think the first step is trying to get, trying to encourage patients to increase fluid intake, which is very challenging um, for people, especially, um, you know, people who work, but um, the goal is to um, try to increase fluid intake to at least three liters daily that will drop your supersaturation. Um, certainly consider a long-acting thiazide. Um, and I have hypercalceric patients in quotations just because, again, it's a continuous variable. So I wouldn't give it to a patient with a urine calcium of 100, but I might consider it in someone who's still forming stones and has a urine calcium of 170. Um, Long-acting um, thiazides are preferred. Um, just keep in mind that um, patients very commonly get hypokalemic on thiazides, and so um, that causes hypocitraturia. So you want to maintain their potassium above four, and you monitor their magnesium, ensure that's above two. Um, and then you might even consider um, potassium citrate when their supersaturation um, gets under one. Otherwise, use potassium chloride or even amylaride. Um, and then finally, um, yes, you can consider potassium citrate in your hypocitraturic patients once you get their, their supersaturation down. And follow these patients closely because, again, they do have recurrent stones um, and uh, can be very difficult to, to treat and manage. So I apologize for going over. Um, that's, that's all I have. And I'm open to any questions if there's time. Thanks so much, Vanula. Maybe we can just uh, turn to the one question in the chat from, from Kelly. So there's a question about what about the role of nanobacteria? Connie Davis used to send us occasional stones for EM to look for a potential bacterial cause for stone formation. You know, is this still considered? Yeah, so this, this so Stoller's work um, found a lot of Nutrivil activation, um, but did not find any bacteria. So there were... Um, sort of nanoparticles of calcium and phosphate um, with inflammatory mediators, um, but no bacteria. So I think, I think there certainly is an inflammatory pathway um, that does not seem to be related. At least the, these, I think the imaging now is um, so advanced um, that no, we're not, we're not seeing that, but the inflammation, yes. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for such a comprehensive overview. And I think we will uh, move on to our final speaker.